internet dating boom has been around for nearly 20 years, and there are now nearly 9 million singletons in the UK searching for love and friendship online. Online dating has completely changed the way we date. But dating can be a dangerous business, and with dating moving online and now onto apps like Tinder and Grindr, it's becoming more perilous than ever. The thing about the cyber world is it connects people who would not ordinarily get on with each other in real life. Crimes involving dating apps have risen sevenfold in the past two years, with more than 400 offences reported to police last year, including assaults, rape, child sex grooming and even murder. You have no way of knowing what kind of a person they are until you meet. How Safe is Looking for Love Online. With more than 3 million users logging on every day, PlentyOfFish.com is Britain's largest free dating website. Because Plenty of Fish is free, it's not really tailored to any specific type of person. It has a really wide database. You can communicate with people that you wouldn't ordinarily communicate with, but also people are able to market themselves in a different way. Behind the keyboard, you can be a completely different individual. That's, that's the concerning aspect of it. In December 2015, 26-year-old Carl Langdell began exchanging messages with 23-year-old Katie Locke via plentyoffish.com. Katie was a, a beautiful young girl who clearly had her whole life ahead of her. She was described by everyone who knew her as a wonderful person. She taught at a secondary school in Hackney and was very popular there. On the face of it, Carl Langdell presented himself as being a very upstanding young man. You wouldn't look at his social media profiles and think he was anything other than normal. He appeared to be a successful lawyer running his own firm. He appeared to have a postgraduate degree in communications. He'd done an internship at the independent newspaper as a journalist. He had a blog called Ordinary Decent Human which um, referenced humanitarian issues. He published poetry, he seemed articulate. There were photos of him with Boris Johnson at, at events. Pictures of him on his social media profiles, they showed him with friends, playing golf in exotic locations, going to watch the cricket, female friends, commenting on his pictures. Her evidence is that he's a successful academic young man and there's enough truth in his fantasy to a degree, that it would be very hard not to believe that he was completely viable, that he was an honest person who essentially was a relatively good catch. There was nothing in any of it that would make him seem like a monster. They seemed to quite like each other and so from there they arranged to go on a first date. She didn't immediately just meet this guy for a hookup. This was something that was planned over a period of two weeks. They went to Traffic Bar, a really trendy, hipstery part of London called Shoreditch. Katie had taken the precaution of telling a friend the guy's name, showing, showing her a picture and she sent a text to this friend during the date to say it was going well. She actually did everything that anyone who's been trying to be safe online would do. The night progressed, it seemed to be going well. As far as we understand, Carl drank a lot more heavily than Katie and then became quite ill. He was vomiting a lot, he was very unwell. The fact that he drunk himself to excess into a situation where he was vomiting and paralytic essentially suggests that he either had a plan, which was that he wanted to make Katie vulnerable, or that he knew that he had some very malicious intent, so he may have wanted to either create Dutch courage or disarm himself so that he couldn't go through with an awful plan. We'll never know, but certainly the behaviour is completely out of context with an expected situation when you first date. Katie, possibly concerned for Carl's well-being, decided to go with him to his hotel. She looked after him. She spent £65 in a taxi. She subsequently spent £80 because he had been violently sick in the taxi. So she obviously had her wits about her. The hotel is it's called the Theobalds Park. 
hotel. It's a four-star hotel, so it's very plush, very nice. The fact that Carl Langdell is somebody who's already pre-booked a hotel suggests that firstly he wanted to control the night, he wanted to bring Katie back, but also he wanted to live up to the expectation she had of him, which is that he's successful and affluent. But it demonstrates this possible desire for ownership, you know, to have some control over where their relationship was going to go. When they arrived at the hotel, the receptionist helped Katie with Carl. He, he, was, he was a wreck. Uh, Katie seemed, seemed relatively sober, um, according to this receptionist. They went to the room. They, we know that Katie called down and asked for some toothbrushes and that the receptionist delivered that to the room. And at that point, they, they seemed perfectly fine. That was in the early hours of, of the morning of Christmas Eve. That was, that was the last time anyone saw her alive. Still to come. Carol had a strategy. Once the door was closed, he decided that that was it. He was going to carry out his fantasy. In early December 2015, Carl Langdell met Katie Locke on the dating website plentyoffish.com. After two weeks of messaging, they arranged to meet in London for their first date, the day before Christmas Eve. When Carl began drinking to excess, he became violently ill and convinced Katie to help him back to his hotel in a cab. The police and Katie's family believed that she only agreed to go back to the hotel with him because she thought he was in danger. She thought she needed to make him feel safe. Carol had a strategy and that he was able to literally execute that strategy by luring Katie back to that hotel. Once the door was closed, he decided that that was it. He was going to carry out his, his fantasy. He had been sectioned. He had a suspended sentence, which was issued to him weeks before that related to an incident where he threatened to kill a girlfriend's younger sister. He told psychiatrists that he had fantasies about raping and killing young women. He had a long history of mental illness. Carl Langdell had been diagnosed with emotionally unstable personality disorder. Essentially, somebody with this disorder will often be quite violent, very spontaneous in their behaviour as well. And on top of that, very often they are plagued by incredible self-doubt and huge fears of abandonment. So Carl was an individual who undoubtedly had some very dangerous traits. Of the morning after Carl Langdell had killed Katie Locke. He wrapped her body in a duvet and then used a laundry cart to transport it to a fire escape and dragged the body down the stairs and then took it about 50 feet into woodland um, and submerged it there under some leaves and branches. After that, it seems he just went back to bed and got up in the morning, ate breakfast, after checking out the hotel, Carl Langdell went home. Uh, he lived with his parents in Chesham. He walked the family dog. He acted as if nothing had happened. There's an almost clear level of disassociation between what his actions are and how his behaviour is. And you can't help but acknowledge that this would fall on the psychopathic scale. This is an individual who is able to disregard his actions and to act to all intents and purposes completely normal around people that he knows. Meanwhile, Katie's family had no idea where she was. Katie didn't arrive for an engagement that she had previously made. Because Katie had taken the very sensible precaution of telling her friends who she was going out with and where they were going and sending a picture of him, it was very easy for them to find where he lived and where his family lived. Katie's father went there to ask Carol's mother if she could find out what had happened to his daughter. Carl's mother called him while he was out walking the dog and literally confessed to the whole thing that he was a monster. I can only imagine how horrifying that would be to stand there on Christmas Eve and be told by someone that you don't know that you've just met that your daughter has been murdered. Katie's father called the police and they arrested Langdell immediately at Lee Valley Park. 
Whilst in custody, Langdell admitted everything. The fact that initially Carr confesses his crime suggests that he has a level of conscience. So admitting it, first of all, is a way of cleansing his conscience and offering an explanation i.e. let's make it seem that I take responsibility because maybe that will mean I am punished less. But then when he realises the gravity of that confession, when he realises the impact of people being aware that he's a killer, he starts to try to claw control back. He tried to claim it. It was a game gone wrong, a game gone too far, that he'd had too much to drink. Uh, so even then, even when he was telling them what he'd done, He's trying to control the situation. He's trying to get away with it. He claims that he asked her if she was into S&M and that she said she was, and tried to claim that the murder was a sex game gone wrong. But everyone who knew Katie, including former boyfriends, said that couldn't have been true, that she, she wasn't into that kind of thing. I've been to a fair few court cases now, covered a few murders, but this one was particularly high profile. The atmosphere was tense in there. You had the victim's family, very emotional, very upset. And then you had the killer. Carl Langdale sat in the dock in his gray prison tracksuit. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, uh, Carl Langdale claimed that he didn't attack Katie before he killed her. He said, that he just squeezed until she was dead and he didn't know what came over him. He's manipulative and controlling. And I think all through the case, he tried to control it on his own terms. And he must have just put Katie's family through absolute hell. I've been writing now for around 20 years and you write about these things constantly but this was so depraved that it really sticks out in your mind. I think about this case all the time. I mean he had such a direct conviction. He threatened to kill a young woman and now he was on a dating website where he can meet young women. That shouldn't be allowed to happen. These apps need to take some responsibility. They need to make them safer because otherwise this could happen again. We contacted plentyoffish.com, who stated that they take the safety and well-being of their users very seriously, and they're constantly improving their systems to make their communities more safe and secure, and advising their users to exercise caution when meeting strangers, whether online or not. There are more than 1,400 dating websites and apps in the UK, and one in five adults have sought love online. Some are seeking long-term relationships, for others, it's all about hookups. And the biggest hookup site in the gay community is Grindr. There are a lot of different gay dating apps. The largest in the UK is Grindr. And actually, the popularity of apps like Grindr um, and others has been linked to the reduction in the number of gay only or gay specific venues that operate in, in London and other cities around the UK because you can meet someone from the comfort of your phone who might actually live just around the corner from you. Grindr is an app that majority wise is about having sex. It's about hooking up with people who are near you and having sex with them. But the reality of that is it puts people in incredibly dangerous situations and can at times have devastating consequences. On the 13th of September 2015, 25-year-old forklift driver Jack Taylor logged onto Grinder from his home in Dagenham. Just before 2 a.m., Jack was contacted by Stephen Port, who was less than four miles away in Barking. He thought he was communicating with a young, athletic gay man. But unbeknown to him, Stephen Port was a 41-year-old serial killer who wore wigs and makeup to lure in young victims. After exchanging messages for a few minutes, Port asked Jack if he'd ever taken tea, meaning crystal meth, to which Jack replied, never have, mate. There is a growing trend on Grindr that gay men are hooking up for drug-fueled sex. Now, the reality is that the majority of people on that app won't be. This particular app allows you to specifically ask for particular needs to be met. 
And if you do just want to have sex with people, the chances are somebody's going to agree. And that puts you ultimately in a very precarious situation. Jack Taylor met up with Stephen Port at Barking Station at 3 a.m. These are the last known images of Jack, seen on the left, walking with Port through Barking Town Centre in the direction of Port's flat. Within 36 hours, Jack was found dead. His body was propped against a churchyard wall. His shirt was pulled up over his belly. No mobile phone was present. He was found with a syringe and plastic bottle containing the liquid GBL that can be transformed into GHB, a common drug on the gay scene. The police deemed it a non-suspicious drug overdose. The reality was that this was Port's fourth murder victim in 15 months. On Sunday the 13th, the time when Jack Taylor is either dead or dying, you're searching for a boy drugged rape, etc. Why is that? Um. Ryan Edwards was a long-term friend of Port. I lived diagonally opposite to this guy who often was visible with other young men, so it didn't take me long to um, figure out that he, he might be gay like me, and so I just introduced myself. I quickly discovered with Stephen that he was a very quiet guy, and in fact he, he was actually quite hard work, so he often would respond in a muted way, one or two word answers, he would often not give eye contact. Even though he was a big frame, you know, he almost had a lumbar when, when he walked. Um, to me, he did seem like a child trapped in an adult's body. Despite being shy and timid, Port's online profiles painted a very different picture. I knew Stephen used a few apps and, and various websites to, um, to meet guys. Things like Grindr, Gaydar, Planet Romeo, Fit Lads. And sometimes, actually, I'd be around there and we'd be having a coffee or what have you, and then he'd be looking at these different screens, you know, and messaging guys and things like that. And I thought, how, how is he getting this number of guys? Port's success rate was down to his prolific presence across a variety of sites and apps. In total, he had 18 different accounts, and all of them portrayed a very different side to Port. He was using a wig, he was using sometimes other people's images to present himself as someone other than he was. He was an Oxford graduate, he'd been in the Navy, he worked with young people, when actually his reality was he was a low paid chef working at a bus depot. He placed profile positions being in the Navy that would attract a certain type of individual. Being a youth worker maybe with children, that would again attract a different kind of character. By doing this, you are acknowledging the possibility of having lots of different types of people get in touch with you. Refining the search criteria amongst the various apps enabled Port to find his perfect type. Stephen was into twinks, and in the gay community, that's a term for um, a young, slim, um, sort of fresh-faced young guy. And Stephen was definitely into them. So the younger, the better. He would screw his face up in horror at the thought of um, you know, going out with anyone over the age of 23. He would contact people who he thought fit that sort of profile. At some point early in the conversation, he gets on to, do you use drugs? Or sometimes, do you mind if I use drugs while we have sex? These men would come round to his flat for sex. When they were there, they were probably very unaware that they were actually in a, a very dangerous place. Stephen Port, when the lights are off, is injecting them with the substance without their consent. He was just, you know, selecting them at whim, um, and it was like Russian roulette. And, and you know, unfortunately, if, if you were the person that the revolver landed on, then we know what happened. At 4:18 a.m. on the 19th of June, 2014. The ambulance service received a call to report an incident embarking. The ambulance, what's the address of the emergency? The caller was Port. Cook Street, there's a young boy, he's got his caps outside, I don't know. Outside of which number? 
When the emergency services arrived, they found 23-year-old Anthony Wolgate sitting slumped with his top pulled up. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Still to come. Death is unsettling anyway, but when there's another body that turns up in that same space, you, your mind does start to wander and you do start to, to, to worry. Serial killer Stephen Port fantasized about drugging and raping young men. He used various gay dating apps and websites to lure his victims to his flat in Barking, East London, where he turned his fantasy into a reality. At 4.18 a.m. on the 19th of June, 2014, Port anonymously called 999 to report an unconscious man slumped against the wall outside his flat. This man was 23-year-old Anthony Walgate. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Anthony Walgate uh, was a fashion student who met Stephen Port through a website uh, called Sleepy Boys. As far as we know from what happened next, um, he went to meet Stephen Port and was given an overdose of GHB. We can't be certain uh, what happened inside the flat, obviously, but if you walk from Stephen Port's uh, door, um, sort of 15 paces, that's where Anthony Walgate's body would have been found. The cause of Anthony's death was given as self-inflicted GHB drug overdose. Anthony had taken reasonable steps to ensure his safety by telling friends he was staying with Port, who was brought in for questioning by the police. At first, he denied all knowledge of Anthony, but eventually confessed that he'd hired him as a gay escort on the website sleepyboy.com. Port claimed Anthony had taken drugs, and after having sex, he went to bed. Port claimed he woke up and found Anthony stiff and rigid and panicked, so moved Anthony's body outside. Had the police examined Port's laptop that they seized at the time, they would have seen he'd searched the web for gay teen knocked out rape within minutes of looking at Walgate's escort profile. The death was treated as non-suspicious, but Port's initial lies to the police meant he was later charged with perverting the course of justice, but for now, he was released on bail. The fact that Stephen Port is placed on bail, even though he knows that he has drugged, raped and murdered a young man, means that now he feels a permission base. Even when he acknowledges involvement in that young man's death, he's not actually given any strong consequences. And that fuels this sense of invincibility and his arrogance grows. So of course, the first thing that he's gonna to want to do is to carry on what's given him this fantasy and enjoyment and sexual experience that we see with Anthony. In August 2014, just eight weeks after he'd taken the life of his first victim, Anthony Walgate, Port met 22-year-old Gabriel Cavari online and convinced him to move in with him. I think I first met um, Gabriel in 2014, um, and as was almost a, a tradition with Stephen, um, when he got a new guy, he would um, often message me to say, you know, come round, neighbour, have a coffee, meet the new guy. Then I kept in touch with Gabriel subsequently, um, you know, via online apps. So I was swap swapping a few messages with Gabriel, um, especially because I got the impression from him that he was unhappy where he was currently staying. And then all of a sudden, you know, Gabriel just stopped communicating with me. On the 28th of August, Gabriel's body was found by a local dog walker in St Margaret's churchyard just 400 metres away from Port's flat and where Anthony Walgate's body was dumped. Like Anthony Walgate, Gabriel was slumped against a wall, his midriff exposed, and with a deadly amount of GHB in his system. The, the truly shocking thing, looking, looking at this retrospectively, is that I was completely unaware that Gabriel's body had been found locally, even though I live 
within a few hundred metres of where Gabriel's body was found, because there was just nothing from the police. Gabriel's cause of death was declared a non-suspicious GHB drug overdose, just like Anthony. The police, however, didn't link the deaths. Port had got away with yet another murder, and just weeks later logged on to the gay dating site FitLads, where he found his third victim, Daniel Whitworth. On the 3rd of September 2014, Port messaged Daniel, asking him out for a drink before dinner at his flat. Daniel told his work colleagues he was going to meet friends in Barking on the 18th of September. 48 hours later, his body was found by the same dog walker in St Margaret's churchyard, slumped up against the wall on a blue sheet in almost identical circumstances to Gabriel Cavari. I've come through and I've seen somebody else, a, a different boy, sitting in exactly the same position, leaning up against the exact same wall. And I'm thinking to myself, Please, God, no, please, not another one. Like both Walgate and Gavari, Whitworth was found to have died from an overdose of GHB. Tests showed he'd also taken sleeping tablets, which was consistent with the alleged suicide note found in Whitworth's pocket. Port, he left a suicide note uh, with Daniel Whitworth's body um, in St Margaret's Church in a, a ploy to sort of throw the police off. It begins, I'm sorry to everyone, mainly my family, but I can't go on anymore. I took the life of my friend Gabriel. Gabriel was Stephen Port's second victim. We was just having some fun at a mate's place and I got carried away and gave him another shot of G, um, GHB. So he's alleging that Daniel Whitworth and Gabriel Cavari were having sex at a party with drugs and that's what killed Gabriel Cavari. So he's blaming his third victim for his second victim's death. And this is the bit where we get into the sort of the reason that Daniel um, Whitworth killed himself, apparently. I know I would go to prison if I go to the police and I can't do that to my family. And at least this way, I can at least be with Gabriel again. I hope he will forgive me. Stephen Port then adds this line to just ram home the fact that he can't have had anything to do with this, despite the fact that this note will be found with a victim who is on top of a blanket with his semen on it, Stephen Port's semen. BTW, please do not blame the guy I was with last night. We only had sex, then I left. He knows nothing of what I have done. I don't know why anyone who would commit suicide would write that, but I, I don't even know why Stephen Port would, would write that. It's, it's like he hasn't th thought it through again. It's just like he's, he's panicked and thought, I better come up with something, something to cover my tracks. Homicide officers from the Met Police were called in to assess the deaths, but deemed them to be non-suspicious. The blue sheet that Daniel was found on was not tested for DNA at the time. Port's fake suicide note had worked. However, in February 2015, five months after he'd killed his third victim, Port pleaded guilty at Snaresbrook Crown Court to perverting the course of justice for lying to the police and initially claiming he didn't know Anthony Walgate. The prosecutor said, there's no suggestion that Mr. Port bore any criminal responsibility for the death of the young man. Port was sentenced to eight months in prison. Stephen Port goes to prison for perverting the course of justice. And whilst he's in there, he will be reflecting and acknowledging the fact that he has actually been sentenced for a very minor crime for an involvement in one death, when actually at this point, he's murdered three innocent young men. So what we see is a man who will come out of prison incredibly arrogant, feeling invincible and above the law, and having grown in his dangerous intent. When Stephen got out, he, he was the same old Stephen, absolutely. He was back on the apps, back on the revolving door of, you know, a, a quick succession of men. Death is unsettling anyway, but when there's another body that turns up, in that same space, 
in very similar circumstances and then it turns out that he's also died of a drug overdose in this case of uh, being spiked with GHB and with meth you, your mind does start to wander and you do start to, to, to worry police initially treated it as um, just another drug overdose but his family they put pressure on the police and they said we're not satisfied um, there was also the fact that they said you know um, Jack didn't take drugs he, he wasn't that sort of person and they basically pushed uh, for CCTV footage um, to be made public by the police the next morning about half past eight in the morning, I'll never forget this, when a neighbour sent me a link to say that, you know, Stephen Port had been arrested under suspicion of, of these four murders. And I sat bolt upright in bed. It was sort of, a, you know, it was like an icy chill because then I immediately went back to the circumstances around Gabriel and not really believing what Stephen had said to me at the time. And then I knew with dread realisation that that's what really happened. Are you telling us the truth, Stephen? 100% truth. About all of these boys? Yeah. Young boys in the early stages of their youth, really, in terms of in their early 20s, all found dead. Stephen? Yeah, I understand, but. Close to your house. One of them had been in your house either just before or at the time when he died and was found to have large quantities of a drug in his system. The other three were all found just over the road in the churchyard, or just beside the churchyard in that area that we've discussed, yeah. propped up against the wall, a short distance from your house, all again with high levels of GHB in them, enough to kill them. Highly unusual way to die for one person. This is four all found very close to where you live. All men, young men, the type of men that you say that you find attractive. All now dead, Stephen. I know nothing about the other three, how they come to be. After murdering his fourth victim, Jack Taylor, when he's being interviewed by the police, the only crime that he acknowledges is his involvement with Anthony's death. The reason that he does this is actually to suggest that there is a level of honesty to his nature. So he really has been caught full stop now. But by acknowledging a truth where he's already been punished, he hopes that that will give the officers an idea that he must be telling the truth on all of the counts. And that's a very manipulative way of dealing with this kind of scenario. Again, feeling that you can outsmart the evidence. He's done it once, he'll do it again. Port was charged with murdering, drugging and raping the four victims. Eight other men came forward stating that they too had been drugged and raped or sexually assaulted by Port. Stephen in the dock looked like um, a creepy old man, really, to me. Obviously, I'd never known about the wig, but with the wig gone, you know, and him being virtually bald, and without his makeup on, you know, his face looked drawn and tired. He kind of, he gave me a sort of a crooked smile. It was like a sort of um, a half smile, almost like a naughty boy that had been caught out at school. It was that kind of look, which is, a bit haunting, really, given the, given the circumstances, but in keeping with that strange childlike persona that perhaps he could switch in and out of as he wished. Stephen Port did not admit anything uh, that he'd done. He denied all 29 charges. Stephen Port's defence uh, rested basically on blaming other people, just, just shifting the blame around, denying responsibility, very much in the way that you'd expect a child to. Um, when caught doing something bad by their parents. What Stephen Port was looking for online, um, that was mentioned in court on the first day. It was uh, very much, he's looking for videos of drugged, young-looking gay men being raped. 
Um, that, that was his fetish, that's what turned him on. For Stephen Port, the end game was to actually do that in real life. That, that, that was his goal. The judge in the trial actually said that him satisfying his, his kink and his fetish became like a compulsion that he, he just he, he, he just would just had to do it all the time and he put that that satisfaction that he was seeking above the lives of you know four young men and above the dignity of other victims who he raped and sexually assaulted I'm very happy that he's going to die in jail uh, because I know Stephen, and I know that you know if he was to be let out, he he would act like nothing had ever happened, and he would go back to meeting guys, drugging them, raping them, and killing them ultimately. So he's a real danger to society. Out of the tragedy that has resulted from the actions of the serial killer Stephen Poor, there is greater public awareness of the risks of using online apps to, to meet people for dates and for hookups. We will only be safer when people are, more, are better educated about the risks of what they're doing. It will have to come from better education and better guidance by the technology companies behind these apps about how to use them safely. Still to come. The very fact that he was already researching things like life in prison says that he knew what he was going to do. Nearly seven million people in the UK have signed up to dating apps and websites. With this fast-growing trend of online dating comes an increase in crime. Dating app and website offences have increased sevenfold in just two years, with reports of killings, rape, grooming and assaults all on the rise, calling for more security measures to be put in place. So different sites and apps will use different measures to check people are who they say they are. Some will require you to film a video saying a certain word to guarantee that you are the person whose photos you're using. There are sites which will make you upload, say, a, a driving licence or a copy of your passport to check that you are who you say you are. And obviously if a site is paid for, then you'll be giving credit card details which can help establish that you are the person you're saying you are. Despite the protection on offer from a majority of companies, people are still encouraged to be vigilant. There are precautions that you can take. Make sure that you stay on the site with your communication with them. Don't let them take communication off the dating site. While you're on the dating site, it's easy to block them, report them, and the dating site will monitor the things that they're saying. So if a conversation turns abusive, the dating site will intervene to stop that happening. Luring people away from the protection of the sites was a tactic used by serial rapist Jason Lawrence. Lawrence used two pictureless profiles, Keep It Straight Today and Straight Man Looking, to contact several thousand women on Match.com. He would then ask them to continue communicating using private texting or emails, luring his victims away from the safety measures enforced by the website. When he finally met his victims and got them in private, he'd force himself upon them. What these apps are doing is essentially creating a perfect breeding ground for having low empathy, expectant behaviours such as immediate sex, and it also means that particular predators can meet with more vulnerable individuals and exert that level of control over them because there is this expectation that it's normal to go ahead and have sex straight away. In 2016, Lawrence was found guilty of five counts of rape, one account of attempted rape, and one count of sexual assault. During the investigation, it became apparent that four of the victims had previously reported Lawrence's behavior to the website, but his profile was not removed. This whole situation is a tragedy on numerous levels. We have a man who was known, yet he was allowed to carry on moving around in society, online, making dates with unsuspecting potential victims. A Match.com spokesman said, we take our users' safety very seriously and continuously advise our community to be vigilant, report any suspicious activity and pay attention to our safety recommendations. Sadly, there is a tiny minority of people who set out to harm others and the ways of doing so are always changing. The firm said it had been unable to initially remove Lawrence's profile 
because the abusive messages had been sent outside of their website. When people move beyond what we're able to see, it's very difficult for us to adjudicate on what might have happened. We have since updated our procedures and introduced a zero-tolerance policy for reports of serious offences that happen on our site or elsewhere. The thing about the cyber world is it connects people who would not ordinarily get on with each other in real life. Usually you need to spend time with somebody on a one-to-one -one level to truly get whether you connect. In April 2014, a teenage girl from Surrey was stabbed multiple times by American teenager Shane Coffey. She'd met him on an online gaming site. Although they actually hadn't met in person, they'd been corresponding online for four years. What we see in this relationship is something that's becoming more and more common, where people don't even have to physically connect with one another to feel like they have an intimate connection with another human being. One person can just enjoy conversing with another human being, but the other person may fully be invested in you and may want to have a life fulfilled with you. In February 2014, the victim discovered that Coffee had placed Trojan Horse software on her computer so he could spy on her. After a huge row, she blocked him on WhatsApp and asked him never to contact her again. He did rebuild her trust and they started to communicate again, but once again, he became very, very obsessed with her. So she ends the relationship. Shane cannot handle the fact that she's broken this relationship and he starts to obsessively think of a plan where he can make her pay for what she's done to him. Consumed by his rage, Coffey boarded a flight and travelled over 3,000 miles and checked into a hotel just minutes from the girl's house. The very fact that he decides to travel all the way to the UK demonstrates that he's taken that abandonment, rejection, and he's turned it into absolute rage and hate. Now, she has blocked him in the cyber world, so he will reach her in the physical world. Coffee had Googled life in prison before executing his elaborate plan. The very fact that he was already researching things like life in prison says that he knew what he was going to do. He'd already made the rational process decision to accept responsibility for the murder. In the middle of the night, Coffey left his hotel and went straight to the girl's house. He climbed through the bedroom window and then he attempted to kill her with a hunting knife. Fortunately, her brother heard her cries for help. He came in and hit Coffey with a metal bar before restraining him until the police arrived. Despite sustaining serious injuries, both the brother and sister survived. When he came over and did what he did, he fully knew the consequences of his actions. But that is how angry he was. Making her pay, that was a reward in itself that was worth the consequences. And that's how dangerous he was. <laughs> 